is a very short presentation on, on how cattail harvesting might be a useful tool in your toolbox for uh, remediating some brine water. And as a classic state employee, I did none of this work. So Brian, Connor, Andy, Brent, Wes, and Austin did all the heavy lifting. In fact, they put most of the pictures together. Just kind of a quick update on what Brian is. That's some um, Brian from the Foreman Butte field. Uh, sodium chloride is uh, miscible to between uh, 120 and 150 milligrams per liter. That's about 225,000. Uh, according to UND, under page on brine, here, the average uh, collection line or what you're getting out of the ground for oil production is about 18 barrels of brine for one barrel of crude. Brine, the big issue with brine is it impairs the ability of plants to uptake water and it's kind of a sterile in the end. It's, it's pretty tough on amphibians. And then high enough concentrations, it'll kill some mammals. Fish really have a hard time with it in high, high concentrations. And brine, this is a pipeline spill. And so brine is the, easy, is, is the hard stuff to deal with. That dark stuff on top, that's the crude. That's pretty easy to deal with. You can, this, we dug out, it was dug out where the spill was at or where the release was, and then the surface stuff was burnt off. They put a nice big dike in. They're going to catch all the brine that had gotten out of there, all the salt water that came out of it. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a slippery critter. And it crawled all the way down the hill and killed all kinds of stuff. Brine, brine's really a difficult creature to deal with. It's persistent. This is uh, some land where it's uh, the older 1970s type uh, Pits were, available, were around and it's, so it's still sterile. Well, let's say 1980 at the very latest. So, you know, 34 years later. Uh, the classic way of dealing with, with the spills is the dig and dump. It, it works okay. It's quick, it's dirty. Um, everybody's happy after it's over with, but it's got some downsides. Uh, you know, what do you do with the, with the soil when you're done, when what they have to get rid of. Uh, you, the soil you put back might not be appropriate as far as a seed bank, it's expensive, and it doesn't always capture the brine. In situ, uh, remediation, you know, impacted soils and, and earth, a lot of times they'll be treated with some kind of gypsum or some kind of biologic or some imaginary magical pixie dust. Uh, we, we actually had a company that came in and they had some special stuff they could sprinkle on the brine spill and it would turn it into harmless carbon. And I told them, why not stop? Why'd they stop a carbon? We could go for gold, couldn't we? But no, they didn't quite get that. And then you can either replant with natives. The classic is that or to with some salt tolerant plants and do sort of a, a, a transitional period, just getting some cover on there. Had some... Uh, oats on the right, and this is the Forest Service mix on the left. There's other in situ stuff that we do. I'm not going to pretend that I know anything about electroconnected remediation, but I thought the picture was nice. It seems to have worked pretty well. And to me, this is as magic as that pixie dust. And I kind of like the idea of in situ treatment, if at all possible. I, I think it takes longer. It causes headaches. It's not always successful. You really, and you need a regulator that's going to be open to the ideas too and patient and, and be able to be a bit of a buffer between other people who want things to be done more quickly. But the pros to it is it keeps the original earth and oil structure there's less biological disruption, and and really, this is this is the cutting edge of the science today. This is this is where it's at to figure out some ways to get to these things without digging up the entire earth. And in the long run, I think it will be cheaper. So we're just going to take a real quick look at uh, a brine spill uh, up 
by the Canadian border. Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. This is arrival 22 injection line spill. It was reported on August 4th and 2014 and they lost 1,400 barrels. And we're not really looking at the spill, uh, but what happens here at this spill and just the processes that they went through. And they, and they responded real quickly. They shut the line in, they plugged the culverts, you located utilities, and they began to recover right away, which dominated, dominated remedial action is going to be to uh, pump. Uh, they sampled the bejeebers out of this thing. But as you can see, you know, so when we looked at that bottle of, of brine water there at, at, at 225,000, there was a fair amount out of it. And 125 to 150,000 is your miscible level. Surface waters here were 63,000 on the south side in that dish. Kind of give you an idea of just how rich that was and what contribution in that wetland was probably from that pipeline break and not naturally occurring in that water. So they did a bunch of different things to, you know, to get started. They were really responsive. I'm happy with them. They, 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 they thought kind of out of the box. I kept telling them I wanted them to dig. I wanted them to dig. As a regulator, I want it over with because I want to get on to my next site. I don't want to, I want to spend the rest of my life on this thing. I want it over with. And uh, West Bell and, and Tetra Tech kept telling me, hey, take a deep breath. We got things we can do here. And, and so they, they, they looked at the different stratifications of water concentrations of the salts within the water. And this is a manifold they built and they stuck it in on the south side where they could then take the heavier water off the bottom of that ditch and leaving that, some of that fresher water on top when they were pumping. I thought it was a pretty clever idea and it actually worked really well. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about cattails. And then I, I thought I would include this picture because everybody loves to be in water digging in mud. That's uh, I just, I, I liked the picture and I thought, hey, they actually, they work really hard. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed by them. But really what it's about is see those salt stress cattails. And if you see behind there, the cattails are healthy. This is the spill spot. So all in all, this is what we were looking at. So we had, they put a water barrier, eh, not really all that terribly successful. Uh, and the, the North wetland is, is 30 acres and the South wetland about 60 acres. You can see where the spill is there and then that's where that manifold sits. And so these are the, the type of concentrations that we were looking at, at the, in the soil at the time. And as you can see, some of them are quite high. This is soil and uh, the, they made a nice map of this. They did the EM survey as well, but some of the soil concentrations were up to 24,000. Uh, and that's, that's a, a fair amount of chloride in that soil. And again, I was telling them, let's dig. We got to dig this baby up. So this is what it looked like. And it does, didn't look good. Uh, there are certain species of birds that really like salt water, like brine waters, and even though this is normally a freshwater pond, thought that this was great. So we had American Alvis sets and black neck stilts. I don't know how many of you people have seen those, but they decided they would take up residence there and take advantage of the additional sodium chloride and the, the, uh, macro, the macroinvertebrates that responded to the increased salts. So... This is the small piece of worth with, now we're gonna to get to the stuff that's of value. So in, in April of, of 2015, they collected uh, cattails and area five is outside of the major impact area, same with three. And then one and two are on the north side and minus five is on the south side. And as you can see, the chlorides within the cattail material, within, within the vegetation itself, was up to a magnitude higher in chloride than the stuff outside of there. And this, now there's an interesting piece to this. If you, this is the 2015 and it's in those bombed out cattails. And you'll see that the above is the above vegetation. The below vegetation is the root vegetation. 
And in this bombed out stuff, you'll see that the roots had higher concentrations of chlorides in them than the above vegetation. And remember what early on I mentioned that the thing with the salt water is it prevents the uptake of nutrients and, and those types of things. So they harvested that first bit of, uh, this is the first bit of harvesting they did for cattails. It was in 2015. They took approximately 1,400 square feet. This would, uh, if you go back now to area one and two, it's all on the north side. And this is where they took it out of. That's area one and area two. You know, whenever I do any of these clam things, it always looks so messy. But, you know, really, this is a pretty nice looking wetland. We'll see some other pictures of it. And so then in 2016, they removed quite a bit more cattails. They removed uh, approximately 240,000 square feet. And that's what that looked like. We'll get to some data here in a minute. And so here's 2021. And there's a gap in the middle here that cattail harvesting didn't occur. And then my next presentation is gonna be on chaos and explain why that doesn't happen. Uh, but here's some, this is some data now to go along with this. We've taken out the controls, but we're just gonna look at, they did take data on cattails in 2015, 17, 18, 19, and 21. And you can see that there's a change from the above and below. So in 2017 and 18, 19 and 21, we had lots of regrowth in the cattail population. So the, it, this and this is this is typhalatifolia. This is our the the standard unhybridized natural occurring cattail in North Dakota, uh, and they're really pretty tolerant of chlorides, as you can see here, because they're, but the big difference is when it was all bombed out in the beginning and concentrations were very high, most of the chlorides within the cattails were contained below the surface, in other words, in that root zone. And in afterwards, once it started revitalizing and regrowing, you'll see that the highest concentrations of chlorides are in the surface. And this is, this is significant. So if you're going to use this as a tool, that little Phillips screwdriver in your toolbox, you can take the top and leave the bottom alone and, and still and get a good amount of chloride out of that system by doing that. So just kind of put it all in perspective. There was a whole 4.4 pounds of chlorides removed in 2015. That's a lot of work for just four pounds of chlorides because, you know, they probably get in a bag about like that. But in 2016, 272 pounds, and in 2020, 180 pounds. It doesn't sound like much, but look at what we're looking at here. The, the value of this is I can leave the world in one place and I can still start winning the battle. And so these are some of the concentrations throughout time. So there's, you'll see the chloride concentrations here are from 2014 to 2018. And what I wanted to show here was that the with this is how high those concentrations are within the soils. So if you go to this, I'm probably going to turn this thing off somehow. No, well, that didn't work, did it? Yeah, I did. There we go. Uh, there we go. So this is where they were moving the cattails. So even in 2018, the chloride concentrations are 2,900, 2,100. These are really fairly high numbers for over three, over. Uh, 36,000 there, and yet they've got pretty good, uh, I'm gonna get to a picture here. We've got pretty good cattail growth on it at that time. So these the cattails are pretty tough. You know, they can, they've got the ability to, to be your tool to suck some of that chloride out of the soil. Now we'll go back, but to put it in perspective, you know, it's not, it's not a panacea. It's not like this big epiphany that's going to work for you. The heavy lifting was done through the pumping. From 2014 to 2018, they, they removed, you know, 22,000, 220,000 barrels of, of water out of those wetlands. And it, it's kind of a real quick and dirty calculation on 
how much chloride that is. That'd be 83 tons of chloride. If you back calculate that back to the 1500 barrels, you could maybe find some discrepancy there. Uh, so again, so this is kind of the chaos part of the things. We're able to remove cattails in, uh, in 15 and in 16, and then nothing happens in between there. And again, now in 21, and then we're gonna do it in 22 and the local landowner burnt it. So there were no cattails to harvest. And again, so nothing is perfect. So this looks really good in 2017. And this is why they were harvesting the cattails. And there's kind of a break where they don't harvest any cattails. And you'll see here that you can definitely see that there's one spot within this wetland that has you know, a little bit more alkaline or that type of soil within it. And you walk out there, it's, it's very sodic. And it shows well in the EM survey. So the EM survey here is in the beginning, you know, I think it's 2014 or 15. And then this one here is 2019. And this hot spot kind of area is a bit migrated. And it matches exactly where that's at. So it's pretty accurate. Anyway, so, you know, the, the I'm not sure what the plans are in the future or there. These things get reviewed annually. But I think it, it, that, like I said, I think the important take home here is that you know, in situ is the way to go. We can get quite a bit of chloride up into this vegetation. Aggressively use of, of vegetation harvesting, I believe is a, a useful tool within an entire toolbox, not necessarily a cure, but it's something that would be useful for remediation in the future. And that's a little better picture of the manifold that they stuck in the ditch. Any questions? Uh, when they harvested the cattail, what did they do with them? Uh, they, they, they disposed of them in a landfill. But I'm not sure what, what is necessary. I'm, I'm not positive. That would be something that we could look at to see if there would be a better way to do that. On the year that the landowner burned, did all those chloride basically just go back into the water? I, yeah, they don't they don't go anywhere. What a figure back out of that. Well, since I wasn't there, and so like I said, I'm I'm I don't know what exactly. I believe they cut these after it was froze, so it would be fairly simple to do. And that's from a biological perspective, you know, dealing with vegetation, you can drown cattails. So, and it's actually a pretty useful tool for it. If you can draw down, cut off cattails and fill them up, you can drown them out. So if you're trying to maintain a healthy cattail population, you wanna make sure you cut them high enough that they're not drowned when spring rolls around. Yeah. 